This week on Cross and Crown Radio, the fallout from the recent Supreme Court leak regarding the future, albeit soon, overruling of Roe v. Wade continues to rage on like an inferno as America is forced to deal with the sin of abortion. What do we make of this? The left is still melting down and protesting out front of the homes of Supreme Court justices, while pro-lifers are vaingloriously taking credit. But we abolitionists, we have much more to say. Also, our three headlines include Louisiana House Bill 813 is at the center of controversy because for the first time in history, a bill of total abolition of abortion has made it out of committee. We'll talk more about this. Plus, last week, the White House hosted their correspondence dinner, and per usual, the jokes were out in full force. One of them, however, wasn't so funny. And finally, while this isn't a national news headline, it is important. Abolish Abortion Virginia is hosting a conference here in Fauquier County, Northern Virginia, and you should come. As always, I am your host, Jason Garwood. Thank you for watching and listening to Crossing Crown Radio. If you're anything like me, you probably feel like you're a volleyball at this point, or even worse, a piñata. First, it was the political drama of the Trump campaign, followed by the social drama of an intentional pandemic, and yes, I said intentional, discredit me if it's fine. And then just when those two years of a nightmare were finally over, we were all supposed to change our profile pictures to Ukrainian flags. While this self-proclaimed Great Reset isn't going as swimmingly as planned, there certainly is a lot to be flustered about. After four weeks of non-stop coverage surrounding the war in Ukraine, the narrative was interrupted by high gas prices and inflation, which is still just over 8%. Then came Elon Musk and Twitter, and now our president is back to telling us that the pandemic isn't over and we're still sending billions of dollars to Ukraine after several years of printing trillions upon trillions of dollars. More on the finances a bit later. And then something happened out of nowhere. Alito's majority opinion regarding the reversal of Roe versus Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey was leaked to Politico, and just like the summer of 2020, the powder keg was lit. As we saw last week, people immediately swarmed the steps of the Supreme Court. The apparently exhausted Senator Elizabeth Warren, whose incoherent flabbergasting of a speech sparked much applause, rushed around with the similar incredulity we find at the White House each and every day. Raging leftists took to Twitter and TikTok. Protests were staged in front of the homes of the conservative Supreme Court justices. Jen Psaki endorsed the intimidation tactics in front of the homes, which is a tacit endorsement of a federal crime. Calls for violence from the left were amplified on social media. Just last week, the Senate tried to codify abortion protection, but its procedural vote failed 49 to 51. All 50 Republicans voted against it, and one Democrat, Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia, voted against it as well. Regardless of what happens, it seems like Roe is going to be overturned, which will crank up the heat at the state level. Now, here's the thing. We can talk politics all we want, and there is absolutely a place for that. We can't just avoid that contra the pietists. But there's more going on than just this. For starters, one of the tenets of abolitionism is the gospel of the kingdom. We believe and confess that abortion is a grave sin and that the destruction of image bearers in this way cannot and will not go on unchallenged by the courts of heaven. And we also believe that the gospel is, in fact, the answer. More in a second. But let's face it. Our nation is under severe judgment. As Indian theologian Vishal Mangalwadi points out in the first chapter of his book, Truth and Transformation, a book I highly recommend, the West's economic successes were a result of a morality that came from Scripture. Specifically, the Reformation, which was challenged by the Renaissance and Enlightenment, still held tremendous sway for the development and expansion of the West. America itself, despite the gross negligence and active disobedience regarding African slave trading, 
inherited a morality that was firm and ubiquitous. It is unquestionable. Authentic, biblical Christianity gave us many, many blessings. But what happens when those blessings are presumed upon? What happens if people say in their hearts what Deuteronomy 8.17 warns against? My power and the might of my hand made me this wealth. Deuteronomy 28 verse 15 explains what happens. Quote, but it will be if you do not listen to the voice of Yahweh your God to keep and do all his commandments and his statutes with which I am commanding you today that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. How many curses? 53 verses of cursing. Everything from economic upheaval to expulsion from the land. Quite literally, the land will vomit a disobedient people up and out much like the tilling of a field uproots a weed. The current convulsions we're experiencing regarding the topic of abortion is a direct result of decades of disobedience. We simply have not yet gotten to a place of fully saturated and drenched repentance. Leftists are thirsty for an atonement, and since they do not want Christ's, they want the blood of infants. Molech has to eat, too. The right has been busy chewing on boots and playing the same authoritarian games as the left. Christians heaven help us, are either playing the pietist game or the progressive inclusivist game, and very few are standing on the firm rock of God's holy word. Listen to these words from William Wilberforce, who stated his case back in 1797 in his book that would eventually go on to influence the nation and abolish slave trade in England. Quote, I find it necessary to affirm that the problems we face nationally and internationally are a direct result of the decline of faith and morality in our nation. Did you catch that? My only hope of a prosperous future for this country rests not on the size and firepower of our military, nor on the wisdom of its leaders, nor on the spirit of her people, but only on the love and obedience of the people who name themselves after Christ, that their prayers might be heard for the sake of these. God might look upon us with favor. End quote. Now, I get it. The appalling words and actions that come from the demons who demand the blood of infants is nearly unbelievable and unimaginable. It seems like we're in another Elijah moment. One man against 850 prophets of Baal and Asherah. Perhaps the David and Goliath moment is just as fitting, or even Gideon's 300 against the 100,000 Midianites. Whatever the case, The faithful remnant who still care about God's law, who still care about the gospel of the kingdom and the crown rights of King Jesus, the ones who still believe that repentance, a deep and wide repentance, is still possible, that remnant is out there fighting the Molech worshipers through the preaching of the gospel and the casting down of humanist philosophies. I know many of them. I count myself among their number, and I am exceedingly grateful for them. But the church has to wake up. Abortion is a sin, which is something the pro-life groups do not understand. Right-to-life organizations, along with pietist, retreatist Christians and legislative branches of government, are the ones who do not understand the theological and practical implications of calling abortion sin. They want grace to remain upstairs while we do the dirty work of politics downstairs away from God's influence. The Ten Commandments are clear and unambiguous. Thou shalt not murder. The reason the left and the pro-lifers who go along with it keep moving the goalposts is because their theology is acrid and expired. They want the conversation to be about women and women's health care needs. So, what do the pro-lifers and leftists do while they call abortion a health care issue? And who would dare deprive someone the assistance they need to help a woman whose health is so shipwrecked? Even Amazon has stated that they will offer up to $4,000 in travel expenses reimbursements each year for medical treatments, including abortion. A medical treatment? Hardly. But that's the game that is played, and pro-lifers buy it wholesale. Women are victims. Babies must incrementally incrementally be saved as much as possible. Reproductive rights are a thing, and bills of abolition are austere overstatements to be avoided. That's what they say. Don't want an abortion? Don't get one. 
right? Don't, don't want to own slaves? Don't own one. Same argument. These tirelessly stupid and insane arguments are winning because Christians let them win. Those of us left who haven't been blinded by the pro-life Ponzi scheme know that women aren't victims and that moms and dads are perpetrators against their children. The rape argument is a non sequitur. We don't murder the child for the crime of the father, and obviously the church stands ready to adopt should the situation arise. Certainly the death penalty for rape would curb such atrocities. The life of the mother argument doesn't actually exist in reality anyway, and it's just another goalpost moved around the field. The arguments are silly and sophomoric. They are dumb and bilious. Any, in any case, gospel preaching abolitionists have been saying for years that when we preach the gospel, we are preaching the comprehensive nature of Christ's kingdom, which gives us then the ability to see ethics clearly. The desultory antics of the left matched by the incoherence of the pro-life right, are unable to see the issue clearly because they both perpetuate the autonomy of human reason and its imp uh, Im imminence philosophy. They don't want to look for the creator for what they do. They want pragmatism. This view doesn't want to believe that a baby in the womb has any rights from on high. It wants the deprivation of all God-given rights. This is why gospel preaching... No... This is why comprehensive gospel preaching that deals with the philosophy, the ethics, the justice, the social conditions, the economic aspect, as, aspects, etc., must be first and foremost. Pro-life pietists will sometimes confess that abortion is murder, but they won't follow through with the logic. They are humanists. If it's just a tough economic or sad social situation, then of course they will oppose a bill of abolition. If it's just a sad healthcare decision, well, then of course they'll support heartbeat bills that consign a certain segment of the infant population in the womb to death. If the pietist pro-lifers were to understand the negative aspect of the law, thou shalt not murder, and the positive aspects of the law that comes with it, thou shalt protect life, then they would repent of their humanist thinking and get on board with biblical thinking. They would bring the gospel to the issue along with the ethics that come in its wake. They would stop with the tawdry pragmatism, itself an act of repentance, and start getting with the abolitionist program. We're not getting out of the judgment that we're under by furthering the humanist program. We get out of the judgment by repenting en masse. We get out by turning away from what seems right to a man and instead doing what is right in the eyes of the Lord. A question for you to consider. Would the hearts of men soften to our preaching if the church was repentant? I believe so. Too many Christians think that there is no possible way to win this nation to Christ. They do not believe, as Jeremiah did when he said in chapter 23, verse 29, Is not my word like fire, declares Yahweh, and like a hammer which shatters a rock? If we will not repent for our apathy and wrong thinking, of course we'll view God's work like a carnival prize, that shoddy, air-blown hammer you can win and enjoy for a few minutes. But isn't God's word like fire? Isn't it a hammer capable of breaking the stony hearts of even the most ardent, abortion-loving leftists? You see, our problem today is sheer unbelief. Unbelief is not the absence of belief, it's the presence of misdirected belief. All of us are in God's world, situated inside this in ineradicable situation. All men, women, and children, even the ones in the womb at fertilization, are made in the image and likeness of God. We all live and move and have our being in this world in accord with God's providential care. We are completely and entirely an analog, our existence, our feelings, our doing, all of it is predicated on us being made in God's image, on us being sustained by God every single day. Because we are innately religious, connected to God as his analogs, and because we have sinned and fallen short of God's glory, we must invent, if we want autonomy, our own set of rules, our own program, our own pragmatism, so that we can shield ourselves from accountability to God. Man, the sinner we know, does not just accept the facts. He rationalizes them away from his thinking intentionally. He wants no part of the 
order of God's creation, the very place and thing he finds himself in. The only way to dislodge a person from this sort of audacious pride is the hammer of God's holy word. I'll say it again. The only way to dislodge a person from this sort of audacious pride is the hammer of God's holy word. If we will use it, then God will bless it. And may God grant us repentance. And now for our three headlines. First up, Louisiana House Bill 813 is at the center of controversy because for the first time in history, a bill of total abolition of abortion has made it out of committee. Now, this is from the Washington Post, and it's from their editorial board, and it's an opinion piece, and it says, Louisiana reveals the war on rights that is coming if Roe is overturned. So we have already a little bit of a frustration coming from folks who really need this abortion thing. With the Supreme Court considering whether to overturn Roe v. Wade, Louisiana House Republicans advanced this past week an anti-abortion bill of astonishing sweep. I love that they said astonishing sweep. It's true. Because if it's murder, then you have to follow along, right? What is the outcome of murder in God's economy? The outcome is the putting to death of the perpetrator. The proposal would rewrite the state's homicide statute to ensure the right to life and equal protection of the laws to all unborn children from the moment of fertilization by protecting them by the same laws protecting other human beings. So I know it's audacious. I know it's just so wild and inconceivable, but we're, we're treating uh, humans like humans. That's why abolitionists of slavery uh, go hand in hand with abolitionists of abortion. Same, same idea. Uh, th these are people made in the image of God, so they should be treated as such. So wild claim, I understand. In other words, they go on here in the Washington Post, not only would the bill empower Louisiana prosecutors to charge women who get abortions with murder— because we're treating them the same, right? It appears to declare the use of in vitro fertilization, IVF, right? In, uh, intrauterine devices and emergency con uh, contraception to be homicide too. So what we're saying is you have a fertilization process that goes on, and if that is disrupted through the intentional manipulation of people with murderous hearts, which is why else would you do that, then it's a crime. And... Uh, I don't know if Louisiana still has the death penalty, but yeah, we would treat somebody as a person, a human being made in the image of God, and if that is encroached upon, like IVF is, or, or different devices and contraception that kill the fertiliza fertilized egg, then we, we have a problem. And uh, so HB uh, 813 is made it out of committee, and in fact, as of this recording, um, my understanding is that, uh, and this is actually from another news company, I can't remember now, uh, WDSU News, which the headline says, House Republicans plan to remove language punishing pregnant people from abortion. <laughs> I love uh, Julie O'Donohue, if you're listening to this. Uh, pregnant people? Interesting. Interesting. Louisiana House Republicans intend to remove language from a high-profile bill that would allow prosecutors to charge pregnant patients, <laughs> pregnant women, <laughs> who undergo abortions with murder when the legislation comes up for consideration on the House floor Thursday. So as, a, as of this recording, I don't have any late-breaking late news, so I'm not sure if they did, in fact, remove some of that language or not. By the time you all are hearing this, you may be able to know that information. Uh, there's an amendment that's going to be introduced. Uh, Conservative Repres Re Representative Alan Sebaugh, he's of Shreveport, is going to introduce this uh, legislation, this amendment to HB 813. So it's out of committee, but they're going to try to give it an amendment. Jackson's bill includes prison time and fines, penalties for abortion providers should the U.S. Supreme Court allow Louisiana to enact an abortion ban. So this has kind of been the issue all along, and for all of us abolitionists, we've been saying, just ignore Roe. You don't have to listen to the opinions of the courts. All these other states are doing it with their marijuana and leftist policies. So conservatives, you can do this. <laughs> it's possible. It's a thing. You can tell the Supreme Court, no, 
thanks but no thanks, right? You can tell them no. You can say here in this state, abortion is illegal, and if carried out, it's prosecutable, depending on, of course, witnesses and so on. But as it stands, uh, it can be done. You don't have to follow the Supreme Court. And of course, we abolitionists who understand the gospel of the kingdom understand that courts uh, not only don't make laws, but courts are not the highest courts. The highest court is the throne of Christ, so we must bow before that. So there's a lot of debate down in Louisiana. Some of my friends, abolitionists, they're down there. Um, I wish I could go. Can't go, but I appreciate their efforts in going to try to see this through. Now, the one hang-up, of course, is Louisiana's governor, John Bell Edwards. He has signaled his opposition to this legislation classifying abortion as homicide, and uh, he's, you know, if it gets to his desk, it passed through the House and Senate. Uh, presumably, he being a Democrat, the only Democrat holding office in the Deep South, mind you, he would, uh, this from the New York Times, he would uh, not, he would veto it. So that's the situation with HB 813. If only, though, people have the courage to be consistent. That seems to be the reoccurring problem and pattern here. People do not have the courage to be consistent. Same goes with pro-lifers who, you know, don't want abortion, but, you know, it's, we can't be consistent. Not surprisingly, many of them are Roman Catholics whose theology is defunct and other problems related to that. So the governor says he is, uh, he has supported in history, this is the New York Times, he has, he's an ardent support for anti-abortion legislation, such as a state law barring abortions, including in cases of rape and incest, at any time after fetal cardiac activity can be de de detected, a move that angered many of his own party. So uh, Edwards says, quote, my Catholic Christian faith teaches me to be pro-life. Well, <laughs> you know, he says something he's been he says, uh, which uh, something I've been honest and upfront about with people of Louisiana who I believe mostly agree with me. So the, the tension here is always related to prosecuting the mother. And what do we do in those situations? Because they're victims and we don't want to hurt them anymore. They're already hurt. Well, as someone who's been outside abortion clinics, uh, they're not victims. They're the perpetrators. They're going in there willingly, mind you, so we have motive, right? Why else would you be there? And they're going in to murder their baby boy or their baby girl. But it's interesting that the governor, who is apparently Roman Catholic, and he has himself some semblance of religious conviction, but it's just not quite there all the way. And so um, we need to put the pressure where the pressure needs to be put and placed. And right now, Louisiana is definitely a, a battle, battleground there. So we'll see what happens with Governor John Bell Edwards and this Bill HB 813. Be praying that God would use it. All right, next up. Last week, the White House hosted their Correspondents Association dinner, and uh, yeah, the jokes were out. The jokes were out. This hasn't happened uh, in a couple of years because of the pandemic, but this is from NPR. President Joe Biden addressed the White House Correspondents Association on Saturday night, the first time a president has spoken at the event in six years. I didn't know this, but the event was canceled during the pandemic. That I knew, but I didn't know that former President Donald Trump shunned the event while he was in office. <laughs> so yeah, I don't want to hang out with a bunch of journalists either, especially these leftist ones. The president joked about criticism he has faced in his first 15 months in power and the press, the opposition, and Trump. Just imagine if my predecessor came to this dinner this year, the president said. Now that would really have been a real coup. Yeah, the jokes. Biden joked to the media, I'm really excited to be here tonight with the only group of Americans with a lower approval rating than I have. <laughs> well, you know, we don't trust the media. Sorry. Because you guys don't have a moral compass. It is broken. And somebody should fix it. And we know that Jesus Christ can and does forgive sins. And he can, in fact, fix it. NPR goes on. He also made light of the Let's Go Brandon slogan, which is used by opposition to swear at the president. Not my favorite term. I don't say it. It is laughable. But 
It's foolishness. Republicans seem to support one fella, some guy named Brandon, Biden said. He's having a really good year. I'm happy for him. <laughs> oh, that's funny. It's kind of funny. Kind of funny. Biden was addressing an audience of 2,600 people, including journalists, government officials, and celebrities. Mind you, nobody was masked or social, social distanced, so I don't want to hear anything from anyone about how we need to go back to that. Because apparently people did test positive afterwards, which, by the way, if you didn't know, the uh, PCR test especially picks up on exosome secretions, which happens in your body 24-7. So yeah, anybody go gets tested at any point, it's going to more than likely say positive because, well, that's how it goes. He also had a dig at Fox News. NPR says, I know there are a lot of questions about whether we should have whether we should gather here tonight because of COVID. Well, we're here to show the country that we're getting through this pandemic. Plus, everyone has to prove they're fully vaccinated and boosted, Biden said. Just contact your favorite Fox News reporter. They're all here vaccinated and boosted. Yeah, it's a shame that Fox decided, many of them, to uh, participate in that whole charade. The interesting thing about this event, though, was... Uh, in addition to speeches from Biden and comedian Trevor Noah, the event had skits and talk shows from from uh, from host James Corden and comedian Bill Eichner and Biden himself. Noah said this was this was actually kind of funny. Thank you for having me here. And I was a little confused on why me, but then I was told that you get your highest approval ratings with a biracial when a biracial African guy is standing next to you. <laughs> uh, good good reference to Obama and some of their 2008 days. But as well as the jokes, Biden praised the role of journalism in American democracy. I mean this from the bottom of my heart, he says, that you, the free press, matter more than ever you ever did in the last century. He said, you are the guardians of truth. Well, that's a sad thing to state because just like economic policy, any other political policy, if you don't have a morality to fuel that, to go along with it, then you have problems. Same thing goes for the free free press. The free press was about truth, but that was under the assumption that truth was something objective, something obtainable, something that you could, you could, uh, it was something transcendent, but it was also intelligible. We could, we can deal with truth in that way, but we sort of lost that when we decided to cast God away from us, which is why we have inherited a massive amount of issues because of that. But there is something I want to point out and this was uh, Trevor Noah, who had a joke for everyone. Let's watch that video. Since you've come into office, things are really looking up. You know, gas is up, rent is up, food is up, <laughs> everything. Now, as you can see, Biden's laughing. Everybody's laughing. Ha, 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 ha. You know, rent's up, gas is up. People can't pay their bills. Ha, 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 ha. Not funny. I actually saw that and was very irate about it. I, I, it's appalling to me that you would... I understand the joke. Like, I understand why you would make the joke. This, oh, things are looking up. The president must be doing a great job. And what's up? Well, the, the dollar is losing its value every day because of inflation, uh, because of regulationism and all these other garbage policies of the left. Um, I remember when gas was like a buck 49 there just a few short years ago. What's going on, right? But this is actually a, a frustrating joke. And I'll tell you why. Because Biden's laughing it off. He has no plan, okay? I'm old enough to remember when this tweet, I'm going to flash it up on the screen here, when this tweet went out on June 4th of 2020. It's hard to believe this has to be said, but unlike this president, referring to Trump, I'll do my job and take responsibility. I won't blame others. And I'll never forget that the job isn't about me. It's about you. So, Biden has blamed Putin for just about everything. Bare shelves Biden has become no baby formula Biden. People are genuinely struggling. Gas last week hit another all-time high, 440 a gallon at national average. That was from AAA. People are frustrated. Uh, bills are tightening up. Things are becoming a little bit more difficult to do. And uh, he's laughing it off. 
He's he's laughing up. Twenty six hundred people hanging out having dinner. Whoa, what a what a nice elitist banquet we have here. Haha, <laughs> jokes on them. I think it was Stephen Colbert, one of those comedians who is saying, look, just go buy a Tesla. I, I'll pay $15 a gallon, haha, <laughs> because I drive a Tesla. Are you insane? Are you that out, touch, out of touch with reality? Are you that out of touch with the shrinking middle, middle class? Are you that out of touch that your government policies, the fact that you exist in the form that you exist in, is actually what's hurting people? What's making poor people poor, middle class shrinking What's your problem? <laughs> this, is, this is on you. Of course, monetary policy, you know, I'm with Ron Paul, it's end the Fed, um, get Bitcoin, you know, I like gold and silver. <laughs> we got to hedge against this somehow. But the dollar is losing its value day in, day out because of inflation. Um, I, <laughs> to laugh it off is just unthinkable to me. And to not just laugh it off, but to blame everybody but yourself. To not take responsibility, the very thing you said, President Biden, that you would take responsibility for. It's just, it's mind-numbing stupidity. Mind-numbing stupidity. And uh, yeah, I, gas is going up, goods are going up. I don't know if you've noticed, I've noticed, going to the grocery store, things are costing more. And uh, that's basically, if you didn't get at least an 8% raise between last year and this year, you, uh, you took a loss. And that loss is going to have economic ramifications and it's going to be very, very hurtful for people. Uh, and that saddens me because these policies are what keep people in poverty. But let's just laugh about it at our fancy dinner. All right. Next up. Abolish abortion. Virginia is hosting a conference here in Fauquier County, Northern Virginia, in the Warrenton area, you should come. You should come. AbolishAbortionVirginia.com is where you can go. You can register. Uh, that conference is taking place on Saturday, June 11th, so in just a few short weeks. Uh, come here, gospel-centered teaching about abolitionism, the plan to abolish abortion, and how to navigate the political landscape in Virginia from a biblical perspective while you fellowship with like-minded believers. This is a time of fellowship, of strategy, of encouragement, of hearing uh, preachers and teachers come at you with the Word of God. Our aim with this conference is to educate Virginia. We want to educate the Christians in Virginia especially so they can see the problem of pro-lifeism, the problem of trying to regulate abortion instead of abolish abortion. Now, it is from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Lunch is provided. It's a free event. Uh, certainly, you know, if you wanted to donate, you could certainly donate, but we want you to RSVP. So go to the website, abolishabortionvirginia.com, check out the conference link at the top, and you can RSVP there. And uh, some of the speakers, yours truly is involved. I'm going to be speaking on smash mouth immediatism and the problem of incrementalism. Uh, Ron Kronz, you've heard him on this podcast. He's a friend, a brother. He's going to be talking about blood guilt. And uh, he's also going to talk about the obligation of the church and the jurisdiction of Christ. And uh, I, I love Ron. I love his speaking and preaching. He's going to rock it, I know. Alan Cohen's going to talk about the Christian response to abortion. Alan's a friend. He's a uh, elder with Street Church and Ron Kronz. And Christian Raymond's going to come down from Wisconsin, and, and he's going to talk about abolition in Virginia politics. So again, lunch is provided. We'll have some, some great food. Um, we'll have some coffee ahead of time. The doors open around 9.30. But toward the end of that, we're going to have a panel discussion and Q&A session, and, and that's going to be uh, hopefully a good edifying time for you. So please, please, please check out the website. Um, there are, this is what ex excites me about the abolitionist movement, is between rescue those and, and end abortion now, uh, free the states, they have a lot of abolitionists rising up in places in North Carolina and Pennsylvania next door to us. We're trying to revitalize that here in abortion, and it's exciting. It's exciting to see, and so if you can get to any of those types of events, go, learn, be encouraged by it, help us get these things out there into the world, uh, because the truth of the gospel matters, and it matters for the sake of the kingdom, it matters for the sake of our preborn neighbors who need to be rescued, and so be involved as much as you can. We're going to record these lectures. We're going to put them out there, and certainly they can be shared 
But uh, this is going to be a great time. I'm really, really excited about it. And again, that's the Abolish Abortion Virginia Conference 2022 in the Warrenton, Virginia area here in Fauquier County. And that's Saturday, June 11th from 10 to 4. Uh, come if you can. It would be a great blessing to see you. Well, that's it for us today. Thank you for watching and listening to Cross and Crown Radio. We'll see you next time. The Lord bless you and keep you.